What if there's just three people? <laughs> that would be really weird. That would be, yeah. Well, I was quite surprised at how many people from just completely random places. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then I'll click Admit All. No. Redirect. Oh, yes, we need which channel. <coughs> still, still in the waiting room, 32. I haven't pressed it. You can you can go ahead. Go, go ahead and admit everyone, for instance, okay? I'm just I'm doing the live stream. Oh, you're doing the live stream, okay. All right, let's get started. It looks like we have a stream of people coming. Anyhow, good morning, welcome. I'm Kay Valencer. I'm one of the members of the PGR studio at Birmingham City University. And I'm very happy to welcome you to this event. I'm only going to do a tiny bit of housekeeping now before I hand you over to one of my colleagues who will introduce the event. So the very, very standard, super simple things to say are welcome. Please keep yourself muted for the time being, which we seem to be all doing, thank you. Uh, by all means, keep your cameras on. It always makes it slightly happier for us all to see that we're not the only ones staring into screens. There will be a point at, in, the, in the event, in the workshop, where we'll try to do a few things that are interactive. Don't be too scared. Well, be scared if you want, but um, we'll try to put you into breakout rooms. So at that point, of course, talk and and unmute your mics and, and and interact if you have any questions in the middle as um, andrew is presenting by all means raise your hand put questions into the chat that's all absolutely fine i'll try to with my colleague vincent to monitor those and we'll if anything looks super urgent we'll we'll interrupt and ask for clarifications for those of us joining us on youtube you also have a chat facility um, and I'll try to monitor that as well. Anyhow, welcome. And I'm now going to hand you over to Vincent Obio, one of my colleagues who will introduce the rest of the event. Yeah, thank you, Pierre. Um, yeah, so we welcome you all to this, um, to the second installment of our workshop series. Um, so this work is on digital discourse in the memes, in, in the memescape. Um, we are particularly happy that we have people joining us from all over the globe, not just from the UK. We have participants from Asia, from the Middle East, from Europe, even from Africa. So we are, we're hoping to also have um, people follow us live on YouTube. So you are all welcome to this um, to this workshop. So this workshop is the second in our series, as I said earlier, on a series on thinking, researching, and being online. And I thank my colleagues, Amelie Douche and Pierre Delancer for the work we have all put in to make the series successful. The workshop series has been organized by the PGL Studio of the Faculty of Arts, Design, and Media of Birmingham City University in the UK. Our thanks go to Jacqueline Taylor and Corinne Wamba of the PGR Studio for their help and support throughout this journey. So what is the purpose of, of our workshop series? Um, we thought of organizing the, the workshop series after the chaos and changes that the past year has caused. Um, lockdowns, as you know, have meant that researchers at all levels have had to switch to a digital mode of working virtually overnight. And for some in the art and humanities, this came as a rude, as, as a rude shock, as many found that they were limited in their use of online and digital tools for research. As a result, we conceived the workshop series as a way to help PhD researchers in various countries across various fields, particularly in the, in, in the arts and humanities, to help them understand how to explore a new reality of being online for research purposes. So today, as I said, is the second installment of the workshop series. It comes after the first workshop we had on May 12th last month, which was focused on digital humanities. That was handled wonderfully by Emily McGinn and Katie Cooper from the University of Georgia. The recording of that workshop is available on YouTube, and um, I, I will shortly pop the link in the, in, in the chat for anyone interested. I will encourage you to view that recording 
as it contains a lot of materials on web scraping and corpus analysis and all of that. However, for today, as I mentioned, we'll be focusing on digital discourse in the memescape, and we have our expert, Dr. Andrew Ross, on hand to lead us. I will say more to introduce him um, shortly. And the workshop today will focus on how memes can be analyzed using a discourse analysis framework based on legitimation. Our hope is that you will participate actively in this hands-on session so that you'll be able to analyze memes on your own for whatever research or activity you might be interested in afterwards. I, for one, I look forward to participating actively and learning a lot today. The final instrument of the workshop series will come up next Wednesday. And for this, we'll be having Jean-Rémy Lapère of Bordeaux University, who will take us through the Zoom effect in the presentation of the self. So do also make yourself uh, available for that workshop. You can register online also for you if you have not already done so. And also, um, I'll also pop a link on the registration for that workshop in the chat. Yeah, so now let me introduce our facilitator, of, our facilitator for today, um, Dr. Andrew Ross. Um, Andrew Ross is a senior lecturer in, this, in the Sydney School of Education and Social Work at the University of Sydney. His research interests are interdisciplinary and include critical discourse, and, um, critical discourse studies, political communication, and discourses of new media and social linguistics. His work is diverse in nature, but has two key themes. First, his work has mapped the relationship between language, learner emotions, and the motivation to learn another language. More recently, his work has focused on critical discourse studies, particularly in the area of new media, for example, internet memes and Twitter. He's also interested in exploring the manner in which new media platforms are reshaping language use and communication with a particular focus on the social political domain. And as you can tell, we are happy to have Andrew here to lead us today in, in, in this workshop, and we're excited about it. So I welcome you all once more. I now hand over to Dr. Andrew Ross to lead us in this session. Thanks a lot, Vincent and uh, Pierre. Let me just um, get my slides up here. Okay, yeah. So thanks everyone for for um, coming along. You probably got your morning coffee, whereas I've just finished having dessert uh, here in the evening uh, in Australia. Um, yeah, so thanks for inviting uh, Pierre, Vincent, and I should say Amelie too, who I know is uh, also a convener of this workshop series. So thanks very much for inviting me. I think it's awesome to have, um, you know, to have some kind of community and 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 opportunity to to learn from each other and learn from you know and learn from other experienced academics um, on a regular basis. So good on you guys for you know for securing the you know the opportunity to do this and and it sounds like it's um you've got several other good workshops lined up so that's great um so yeah as vincent said a lot of my work in recent years has been based around new media and digital communication um so hopefully today um it'll give you a, a, well you will learn a bit about my research but also hopefully it gives you a bit of a opportunity to think about about your own research as well and, and how you might approach things. So yeah, my name's Andy Ross, I'm from Sydney. Um, you know, that you can, as you can tell from the view from my living room just behind me, um, looking out over the harbour, um, I wish, that's like the $10 million view. But uh, what I'm going to do today, oops, is start off with a sort of, um, shameless bit of self-promotion well it looks like this anyway um what i'm trying what i wanted to start off with is just um give a sense of some of the stuff some of the work that i do and some of the things that i've done in what looks like this kind of shameless plastering of a slide with things that i've published but um well i mean i guess it is that but what i'm trying to get at here is that um you know there's a lot of opportunity to explore things in new media research, all sorts of different topics, all sorts of different platforms in all sorts of different ways. And this is something that I've sort of, um, I guess, really, really focused on a lot in my own research in recent years. I, I tend to sort of focus on, I guess, my own approach is picking a topic that I'm interested in. Um, and then I think about what's the new media vibe around that? Is there anything happening on Instagram around that? Is there anything happening on, on Twitter around that? Are there any memes around that that are sort of saying anything? Um, so 
this is the kind of thing that hopefully you can come out of today thinking about, um, you know, maybe having another perspective on things and thinking, look, whatever my own research is, maybe I can start to come at it a different way and think about the the broader um, way, the, the things that I'm interested in might kind of appear and evolve through through social media and new media discourses and so on. Um, now, just give me a second. So today I will be talking about um, internet memes, as you obviously know already. Um, this Probably internet memes, I would say, was the was the basis of my first main, I don't know, it, it, to me it felt like the first real main paper that I did coming out of my PhD. So when I, when I published my first paper on memes, and that's what I'll be talking about mostly today, I wasn't that far out of where you, where a lot of you guys are right now in your doctoral studies, you know. <clears throat> so I think there's a little bit of relevance there. Um, as well. So what I'll be doing today is starting off with a little bit of conceptual sort of over background on internet memes. And then I'll sort of talk through uh, one particular study, that paper I just mentioned, um, that I conducted and um, probably is the one I would say that's received the, the most attention at the same time as informing, uh, playing a, a major role in informing subsequent work that I have done on memes as well. And in fact, I would say not just subsequent subsequent work on memes, but subsequent work in other social media platforms as well. So this particular paper was published in, um, in 2017. And as I say, has really played a major role in informing, um, informing my work uh, since then. The study explored the use of a particular analytical framework related to the discursive practice of legitimation or legitimization. You hear it referred to as each of these things. Um, and, oops, one second. Now, so this study focused on internet memes and how they were used or de deployed as an act of uh, delegitimization of the candidates of the 2016 presidential election, Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. Um, so basically I'll talk through this study and explain the framework that I used as part of that study, as the basis for that study, um, with the ultimate aim of sort of arriving toward, at the end of the talk today and giving, and, and as Pierre said, having some kind of interactive opportunity to look at some memes, talk about them and try and apply this framework and even start thinking beyond the framework that I talk about today. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll spend a little bit of time, a very brief amount of time at the end talking about some um, potential future research directions and where I think future research in internet memes uh, would, would be valuable. Um, and that's probably something where um, you guys can give some, you know, give some good input and suggestions as well. So I'm hoping that I don't run out of time. Um, at the same time as also hoping to have a, probably half an hour to, to do some interactive type thing at the end. So it's going to be a sort of a bit of a bit of a balancing act today. So we'll see, see how we go, but let's, um, let's get into it. So to start off though, We've seen them for years. We've seen internet memes for years, um, plastered all over our uh, social media feeds, in Twitter, you know, in Twitter streams and what have you. But but what is a meme? Who who wants to be sort of brave enough to offer up their definition or their understanding of what an internet meme is? <coughs> Pop something, feel free to pop something in the chat, put your hand up, whatever. If there are no responses, you really are putty in my hands tonight, aren't you? I'm just opening up my chat.
Any suggestions? What's an internet meme? Mana says a memes and image that reflects an emotion. Sure. A joke. A joke is something that I definitely think features heavily uh, in in the majority. I mean, I don't think anyone would argue that humour plays a major part in, in internet memes. Emily says viral ideas. Sure. Of course, we can have viral ideas outside of internet memes, but memes, I think, are a vehicle definitely for that. Caroline, a visual joke or contribution to a more general viral conversational topic. There's that idea of a joke again. So, I mean, I think, I think there's definitely already this understanding of the humorous aspect of, of internet memes. Um, thanks for that, guys. Now, the term meme itself kind of, and some, many of you may know this already, but kind of originated with the, the um, evolutionary biologist Richard Dawkins um, and was kind of his attempt to shift the focus of evolution from, from kind of a gene-centric one to incorporate the idea of it being, you know, something more of a cultural phenomenon rather than a gene-based thing. So for Dawkins, a meme was equal to a cultural unit or which, which um, can be considered an idea. And this cultural unit sought replication for its own survival. And I've read in many places that Dawkins sees, Richard Dawkins sees ideas themselves as selfish, um, as virulent and competing to affect, competing with each other to infect our minds, to infect individual minds as further vehicles for, for further conduits for uh, replication, further replication. He included such things as slogans and catchphrases, fashion, uh, fashion fads and so on, as examples of what might constitute a meme in his line of, of thinking when he sort of coined this term. Now, slogans, catchphrases, fashion fads, quite different from the, the understanding of what we see very so regularly as internet memes. But still, this is where it kind of originated from. So from meme, then we need to start thinking about what's an internet meme. So although founded on Dawkins' uh, original idea, the internet meme has taken on a bit of a different meaning whereby internet memes don't mutate and, and um, sort of and spread by chance, but are uh, deliberately uh, adapted by human creativity. And I think that's the that's part of the, the key, one of the key elements I think of internet memes that sort of deliberate nature and the and the human creativity involved. And then they spread through various channels related to the internet. I mean, I mentioned, you know, we see them all over the place: Twitter, our Facebook feeds. Instagram, we'll see them on all sorts of sites like Nine Gag and Imgur and all these sorts of humorous online sites. And so they spread through all these channels and they're typically propelled by some kind of alignment with um, the views or the beliefs or the values, the, the, um, the sense of humour and so on of those among the digital community who receive them. On the surface, internet memes might appear, they can appear to be sort of shallow and somewhat insignificant where, um, I mean, I know my mum and dad don't see them as anything more as silly jokes that are sort of sent around and soon forgotten. Um, yet, I guess while the case can be made that they often lack seriousness, um, what we can't dispute is that memes are a distinctive product of current digital culture and they typify many of the underlying qualities of what a digital culture is. <coughs> so two definitions can be seen here. The first one from Lamore Schiffman. Any of you familiar with memes, um, research on memes, would I am sure know the name Schiffman. Lamore Schiffman is one of the leading scholars on internet memes. Um, and she says 
the, uh, the propagation of content uh, such as jokes, rumors, videos, or websites from one person to other via the internet. Um, and the other one by Gal et al. And, and actually that et al. includes, I think, Schiffman from memory. Um, is kind of the, actually the second one is kind of the definition that I've worked from quite, quite a lot. Groups of items sharing common characteristics of content, form, and or stance, which were created, transformed, circulated, by many participants through digital participatory platforms. Um, so yeah, as I as I say, um, any any of you interested in further understanding and seeing some of the earlier research on memes, Schiffman is one of the is one of the key the key names to look out for there. So um, for internet memes. Um, we can say that really they depend on human agency. They are groups of a kind of digital item, like the images and videos that um, were mentioned in that previous definition by, um, by Schiffman. And they share these common characteristics. Internet memes are created with, a, with an awareness of each other, and then they're distributed online by multiple participants. Thus, the divergent iterations of memes retain certain characteristics or follow a kind of shared, a shared pattern that unifies them, as well as having a shared focus or topic, if you, if you like. So we've all seen, um, in some form or another, internet memes using, um, using a particular template and then just being reiterated into different jokes, addressing different things, but the key image and the key phrasing of the joke will be the same. This is something that's really, you know, a key feature of internet memes. So, and, and stemming from all this I've been saying is the fact that their creation and spread depends in a way on kind of online societal and communal coordination in, in these online networks. I guess what I'm saying there is it, the, the, the spread of memes might seem on the surface sort of chaotic and, you know, disorganised, but it's, it's not really because the way that online networks operate is, is, you know, every online user has a sort of pattern and you, memes are distributed typically through these most common types of channels. Now, memes can serve a, a wide variety of um, social, cultural, political purposes from something as simply as simple as shit, sort of conveying feelings in interpersonal settings to publicly protesting against you know gov governmental corruption or something um, there is a significant strand of research that has looked into the use of memes in political discourse and it's in this zone that i have uh, sort of situated my own work on memes to date in fact, all, yeah, all, all the things I've done on memes have a political vibe to them. Now, um, and finally, based on all these characteristics I've just been mentioning, memes, they can occur in many forms. YouTube videos, photoshopped in images like, like these ones of Trump that I just had to put there because when those ones started coming out, when he became president, I just loved them, these executive order ones. Um, GIFs just simple textual things and then there are probably the most common ones which are image macros which are the ones that um, form the focus of my work now i've just thrown in here an example of something from my own setting here in australia because I, I couldn't help myself and it's a and it's just a way of further highlighting the, the speed with which members of the digital community pounce on something that emerges from somewhere. In this case, it was a photo in the news. This bloke is, um, is Peter Dutton. And at the time this photo was taken, I think it was about 2016 or 2017 or something like that, maybe even later. Um, at that time, he was our immigration minister in Australia. I, for one, have never been particularly fond of this guy, um, but, you know, that's beside the point. But at this particular time, 
he was receiving quite a lot of negative attention around um, immigration policy and rhetoric and so on. This picture emerged in a news outlet and the story then came out, the story then followed that Mr Dutton um, was not very impressed with this um, unflattering picture um, of himself and he, and he requested that it was taken down. Well, this, this got out, this story got out um, and that was all it took for the digital community to see an opportunity for some online playfulness and fun and almost instant, instantaneously a viral meme emerged. Now, I mean, you don't even know this. Most of you don't even know this bloke. Probably none of you know this bloke. But, I mean, I just think these are hilarious. The, what's interesting is that there's no text involved. It's purely image manipulation. And I suspect, I suspect instigated by his own dislike of the picture, um, which acted, a, you know, gave some momentum to the way, you know, the way this came about. Um, but what, what we can't know for sure, we, we don't know who whether each iteration was made by a supporter of this guy or those who dislike him, but we can assume. I mean, you know, through, through, through his own, like if we, through disregarding his own dislike of the image and making it into a widespread joke, he's made into the butt of the joke. He's kind of de delegitimised um, and it's kind of this the way that memes can function in this way that I'm going to get at in, in this talk. Um, but I mean, you know, I just couldn't help myself there. I think some of those are just, uh, are just brilliant. And just before I go on, I can see a question there from, uh, from Catherine. How central is the aspect of satire? Challenging power to memes as a form. I mean, I'll probably touch on this a little bit later and it may even be better to come back to that, but I think, I think it is, it's not essential, but it is, it just has evolved into being um, a, a key aspect of most internet memes. Like most, most of the legitimization, delegitimization or attack or whatever is going on in, in internet memes happens through humor and satire. So I do think it's central. It's not essential, but the ones that we remember, uh, Catherine, uh, the ones that we remember and the ones that spread the furthest and the fastest tend to be really good at the satire. So I guess in that sense, you could say it is really central. I don't know if that sort of answers your question there for now, Catherine. We can maybe come back to it a little bit later. Um, so... Of the many, of the different forms of internet memes that I mentioned before, GIFs, YouTube videos, and so on, image macros are the most common and widely shared. These are those ones, they're very simple in composition. There's an image and some text. Most often the text is using this kind of impact font, not always, but I mean, um, a lot of the time it does. And I guess linked to Catherine's comment, most of the time, humour is the primary aim of the meme. Well, I should say humour is some, often the primary aim and at least it's one of the main aims. You know, if, if, if sort of having a go at a politician or something is a main aim, doing it in a funny way is usually, you know, tied together. <coughs> so there are, of course, memes where the humour is just, there for its own sake and it doesn't you know it's not there to sort of um critique anything or it doesn't not doing anything not do not really doing any ideological work or anything like that um but it is often the vehicle for the communication of something else such as ideological positioning or something like that um so the text will usually in these memes follow some kind of template like what is often called a, a snow clone and what that means is where it's like a phrasal a phrasal template where um you know where maybe one word is taken out and then the user the creator of the meme just puts in their version their word to fill in the blank 
we'll see an example of this idea of a snow clone in a minute. Um, there, there's usually a top text, a bottom text. Again, there's always a, in most cases, but not always thing with these, with these memes, but top text and bottom text, and the bottom text is usually functioning as kind of the punchline for the meme. Image macros are so easy to adapt and they're so easy to change. They're so easy to make uh, with all the meme generating apps out there, um, which is, you know, a large part of the, of the appeal. So here are some examples of image macro memes from a, from a very popular template. This template is known as the, the most interesting man in the world, for those of you um, who didn't know. So it's all it's typically this this guy um, who and and this shot of him in the in the top one and the one on the left bottom left and um, the phrasal template is this this is an this is the idea I was just mentioning of a snow clone so it's if I uh, sorry I don't always X but when I do I Y kind of thing and then the user fills in with whatever they want. Um, so you can see in the first two there, the one on the top, the one on the bottom left, the picture is the same, the same phrasal structure, just the gag is different from the user. Then in the third one, we see um, that the manipulation is taken a step further with um, the phrasal template being retained, but the image being switched out for Leo DiCaprio. Now, these ones here, I'm just showing to, I guess, talk about these aspects of composition rather than to suggest that they're communicating anything sort of, yeah, rather to, than to suggest they're communicating any kind of ideology or anything like that, because clearly they're not, they're not. These ones are really memes that are, I would say, they're for humans sake and, and nothing else. And there are a lot of these out there, right? But there's also a lot that will do this kind of, um, you know, that will fit into this political communica communication genre that I'll get to in a, sh in a second. So then there's the, um, the, the idea of memes as political um, communication. And they've really taken off in this sense. So, you know, every election cycle, they're all over the place. Um, but we need to think about what's, what actually is a, is a political meme too. Um, for instance, internet memes, what they do, they provide users a quick and easy, and you could say mostly safe way of accepting or rejecting different political situations or positions or actions or realities in a public forum. That's an, that's an element of, of what, you know, constitutes in a political meme. They might also, depending on the settings in which they're deployed, be a way of diffusing tense situations around um, political discussions and political, you know, chat. Think just, I mean, you could just think of about how a meme might be shared in even, even as close as your friendship settings with those who have a different political viewpoint to you. Just sharing an internet meme about it, often you can... Um, sort of achieve two things. You can continue to communicate your viewpoint, your, your ideological belief, but at the same time, you can lighten the mood. <laughs> you can sort of get, you know, make it, a, make it a bit more interesting, a bit more fun. And as I've mentioned before, creating and sharing memes is a form of discursive practice. And it does provide, I guess, a safer way in which to engage in political discourse. But it isn't without its own caveats, some of which I'll touch on um, in a bit. Now, importantly, though, political memes do require some form of uh, coherence uh, in terms of position um, or argument. And what I mean there is there needs to be some kind of ideological work involved. And this is perhaps why critical discourse analysis as an approach um, has proven a suitable one for me and for other scholars of, um, of internet memes to this point because there's, with that approach, there really is an emphasis on the ideological work being done by them. 
Um, and of course, memes play a real role in giving weight to current issues as opposed to ones that have faded into history. Um, and that is because they are so closely linked to the news cycle. It's not often we see, it's not often we see memes about some, some political issue that passed 10 years ago. It, they're, they're so closely connected to the, to the moment that makes them um, a suitable kind of phenomenon for members of the digital community to jump on and utilise as a tool of political communication. So <clears throat> this leads me to the, the description I'll give of the paper that I, that I mentioned earlier. So this was done, as I said, in the lead up um, to and following the 2016 election. Um, it was based on my interest in memes and what I've been doing at that time and th the way they can be used in political um, participation and political communication. Um, I looked at internet, uh, sorry, I looked at image macro memes and and I focused on this practice, to, this practice of um, legitimization or delegitimization. So I started looking at memes at this time and um, realized that all the ones that I was seeing um, were, first of all, making fun, and then that links back to the question Catherine asked before, making fun of either Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton. And that, that was the first thing that jumped out. And I mean, that was no surprise. This is what you get used to with internet memes. But then what struck me was that they, you know, they seemed to be doing so as a way of attacking the legitimacy of whoever was the target. So you can, you know, you can picture Clinton supporters making memes of, or Democrats making memes of Trump and Republicans making memes of Clinton and so on. Now the literature around legitimization basically posits that, legitim that legitimacy is achieved by aligning uh, actions or communication with prevalent social values um, and refers essentially to actions with a, with a positive balance. And then so conversely, if anything is, seems to be not aligning with the, the, the sort of prevalent social values and there's not this kind of, there's like a more negative balance, then we start looking at the, the inverse idea, I guess, of delegitimization. So the, this, this, this discursive practice of legitimization or delegitimization has been, you know, a lot of ink has been spilled on, on this already uh, in the field of discourse analysis, political communication and so on. Um, actors and institutions in most fields want to establish legitimacy uh, and, they, and in doing so, they tend to try and strip legitimacy from those who oppose them, right? Um, there's been a lot of work done on this in domains such as public relations, strategic communication, political communication, like we were talking about today. And a lot of this work, um, I should say, a lot of you, I'm sure, are discourse analysts. You can probably um, correct me later if I'm wrong, but, you know, a lot of work on legitimization has been done by the big guns in, in discourse studies, such as um, Wodak, Van Dyke, and Theo Van Leuven as well, um, who's, <coughs> these are probably some of the big names in critical discourse analysis, and they've all, you know, done quite a bit of work on legitimation. So to analyse the memes, I, I ended up utilising Van, Theo Van Leuven's framework of, uh, which includes four key strategies for analysing this kind of discourse. So, if you haven't nodded off already, pay a little bit more attention here because we'll come back to this framework at the end when we, um, when we do something a little bit more interactive. So these, um, these strategies are, first of all, what Van Leuven calls authorization. So this is where le legitimacy is established through reference to the um, sort of authority of tradition law, custom, and basically of, of the people 
um, in whom the authority is traditionally invested in. So you're talking about people like presidents, prime ministers, ministers, um, CEOs, whoever it might be. Um, and ultimately, we're looking at how well do people use their authority um, well, not well, or you know, do they abuse it? The second one is moral evaluation, and this is about um, uh, this is about reference to value systems, and often is discussed in in sort of um, using an analogy or comparison. Good compared to good equals legitimate. Good compared to bad makes one side look legitimate and the other side look less legitimate and so on. Rationalisation is the third one, and this is related to whether an action is founded in some kind of truth or actually connects with the way things are, i.e., is it actually rational? And then the final one is mythopoesis, where um, legitimacy is conveyed through a kind of narrative where that suggests that outcomes reward legitimate action and punish non-legitimate ones. And this is communicated often through moral tales are often cautionary tales. So painting a picture of the future and that future being very positive and lovely or very bleak and dark, whichever way that future is sort of portrayed um, can act as a cautionary tale. Elect this guy, don't elect this guy, elect this woman, don't elect this woman, whatever it might be. So as I analysed the, the memes, I sort of realised that they aligned with these rhetorical strategies. I collected data on memes from two key issues linked to the news cycle at the time. As I mentioned a minute ago, memes are really closely connected to the, to the news cycle. These issues were Trump's proposed border wall and um, <coughs> Clinton's email scandal when she used her private email for classified information and so on, if you can remember that being an issue at the time. I'll just touch quickly on how I collect and did collect, have collected memes in subsequent research and how I did it at this time too. A good thing is that I would have to say that collecting memes is, is easy compared to, <laughs> compared to a lot of other data collection for other types of social media. I just typically canvas a range of sites like these ones uh, listed, um, searching for keywords, searching for hashtags to draw out the memes that I'm interested in. It is important, obviously, they come from sites and platforms that are conducive to their, to their spread, um, where the digital communities are familiar with them and often communicate through them. And then it's just a matter of building a corpus of, um, of memes large enough to be able to analyze them, search for, you know, search for commonalities, search for themes, categories, like a content analysis, and to be able to say that you've kind of reached saturation. So, I mean, I've, most of the studies I've done, I'm, I'm not looking at a thousand memes that I'm trying to, um, that I'm trying to deal with. Uh, I've been looking at maybe no more than a hundred, I guess, in in studies that I've that I've done, because I've been targeting it on a particular issue. That's kind of been enough. <laughs> and I just have that last point. Why it's a bit different to Twitter collection because, you know, with Twitter collection you've got to go to the API, or I mean, you've got you've got to use the API API firehose. Then you've got to collect all the the language, and if you want the if you want the images and the videos too, you've got to include those or not include those, analyze through corpus software, blah, blah, blah. There's all sorts of things going on that make analyzing memes, in my view, much easier. There are um, analytical considerations. And of course, ethical considerations is one. Um, you have to, it depends what you want to do. In none of my own papers, I've never needed to show the, the person or the user who's been sharing the meme. I've only been interested in the meme itself, but there are studies out there who are that are looking more at how things are shared and where they're shared from and who they're shared by. And then there does come the ethical issue. I mean, I think we have journals these days and definitely books will ensure anyway, they're, they're the gatekeeper anyway. I mean, they're going to make sure that 
um, if you don't have permission from a particular user, then you're going to be forced to black out their name anyway. So <clears throat> while it's a consideration, it's kind of not really much of one because when you get to publication stage, you're going to be told not to not to do it anyway. Then you've got to think about what are you, how you're going to analyse. And I've already touched on, you, you want to start looking at categories that emerge, coming up with coding schemas, and then thinking about how are you going to how are you going to analyze those, and particularly with political ones, um, like the ones that I've looked at mostly in my work. You've got this form of ideological work um, where critical discourse analysis has been a perfect fit for me. But then within critical discourse analysis, there's various sort of versions of that fit within CDA that I've been able to use. So what I'll do on the next. A um, few slides is just talk briefly through some of the memes from the study that I've that I've mentioned, and then we'll um, then we'll get to the point where we can have a have a chance to have a look at some ourselves and have a bit of a you know an interactive go. I'm looking at my clock. I've got 13 minutes until I've got half an hour to go. So I'm trying to keep Pierre and Vincent. I'm trying to keep about half an hour to to be able to have a chat and do some interactive stuff. Okay. So this is, these are examples of the Van Leuven strategy of delegitimization through authorization. I mentioned earlier that this relates to authority, people in authority and how they use that uh, authority. If someone in authority doesn't use it um, appropriately, then they're kind of, um, it's easy to de delegitimize them if you, and we could almost say they've delegitimized themselves. The first meme here uh, that you can see, the Trump one, represents this strategy. Um, it shows Trump with a sort of determined, almost maybe even angry look on his face, and he appears to be mid-utterance. This image could be termed position-based authorization in that Trump is connecting the position of president only with an opportunity for a kind of uh, for a kind of self-aggrandizing narcissism, I guess, if you will, uh, which, which we can then say as well is an inappropriate use of authority. In the text of the meme, he's, uh, he's depicted as naming his wall after himself. He's rebranding the country in the White House with his own name. This is suggestive of a belief at that time. You know, this is obviously before, just at the time when he was campaigning to become president, <coughs> that if Trump were to win the presidency, he wouldn't be focused on the issues one would normally want the president to be focused on in an authoritative role, but instead only on furthering his own agenda. The Clinton meme um, adheres to, actually follows that same meme template of the most interesting man in the world. I don't always X. Um, but when I do, I why, but with a little bit of a sort of tweak in there. Her picture seems like it's some kind of, um, you know, institutional picture, smiling nicely in front of the flag and so on. Um, thus, the, the picture itself gives us nothing. And this is where we see this multimodal, this multimodal nature of internet memes. Without the text, there's no joke. It's just an institutional picture, like nothing out of the ordinary, right? But with the addition of the text, the tone of the image changes dramatically. The text implies that Clinton has no problem breaking the law, which is an abuse of authority um, from someone in power. And, you know, her, her rationale that she does so when it suits her amplifies the delegitimization by authorization, i.e. she believes that she's an authority to herself. Obviously, we know that... She didn't, she, not, she didn't say that. She's not saying this. A user is putting these words in her mouth. Same with Trump. But this is how users can get this voice out there in a, you know, in a humorous way to attempt attacking those they don't like. <coughs> the first meme here, we see Berlin, the Berlin Wall. Barbed wire looks like a prison wall. Trump's image is foregrounded, centred, military-style cap, probably representing the Stasi police um, of the period. 
again, without consideration given to the text and no action in the image, um, we should attempt to sort of interpret this image in what has been described as conceptual processes by multimodal um, scholars like Crescent van Leeuwen. What this means is that the image has to be analysed for symbolic meaning. Here interpreted as Trump being allocated this persona and as such being representative of a device, similar divisive agenda um, um, that the, you know, the recontextualization of the, of, um, the Berlin Wall implies, I guess. The text in the meme builds on the image in two ways and it reveals the ideological position of the creator. Um, the text confirms that the meme is depicting the Berlin Wall, so it confirms that for us, and that the creator is um, comparing it with Trump's border wall. Um, so this is that kind of analogy comparison. Um, the top text suggests that the wall will have an extra effect in keeping them, Mexican immigrants, out and will keep us, presumably US citizens, in. So, and, and generally this use of us and them in legitimization discourse relates to, you know, social psychology stuff of in groups, out groups and so on. Um, the, what we don't know is the creator's stance on immigration and in relation to us and them. We don't know that, but what appears to be suggested is the negative aspect of the wall. The Clinton meme shows Nixon, um, which carries this analogy in the meme. That is in combination with the first person I, uh, the main purpose of the image is to attribute the text to Nixon along with establishing a comparison between Clinton and Nixon. Nixon's image is black and white to reflect the time it emerged from a still probably, I mean, it looks like a still from, um, you know, the TV resignation or uh, addressing the Watergate scandal. The textual element adopts Nixon's voice to compare the severity of Clinton's deletions and suggests that actually Clinton's actions are much worse. The, de the, the delegitimizing function of this meme therefore rests in the comparison between the actions Nixon and Clinton allegedly took. Well, not Nixon allegedly, but Clinton allegedly, and the subsequent effect on both of them. The irony here is that for Nixon, the result of his involvement um, in the Watergate scandal and the erased tape was the end of his presidency whereas Clinton here is portrayed as doing much, much worse, but she remained a candidate for the presidency. Um, another connection here is a kind of Bakhtinian one of related to intertextuality where Bakhtin would have said that each word tastes of a context and context in which it has previously lived. So internet memes do this a lot. They'll, they'll draw on previous texts, previous contexts, previous moments um, to bring it into the here and now of the current, um, into the current, um, you know, into the current meme. Oops. Okay. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Um, okay. So rationalization. Two ones here. The Trump meme actually reflects a, a really dumb tweet that he did around that time um, where he basically said the same thing that's on this meme, if you can believe it. <coughs> so the, the meme draws attention to his comment and queries its logic. The image of the Great Wall is used symbolically, shows the connection with, um, with his border wall. Um, most important, though, is the contract, contrast between the image and the textual focus on Mexican immigrants. We, as the, the viewer, the reader, is asked to consider the relevance of the Great Wall to preventing Mexican immigrants from entering the US. I'm sure, I'm sure you're seeing the same sense of irrationality and illogicality that I see in, in that comment. 
Such memes were also used to, um, in, for Clinton with theoretical rationalization. And you can see an example here. The image, um, we, in the image, we see a surprised Clinton, a stunned Clinton, I guess, perhaps representative of the kind of reaction the public had when they became aware of her denial of her, well, first what she was alleged of doing and then her denial of it. Um, but it makes you think, I mean, whoever made this mean, they've taken time to find the right image that fits, that fits what they want to do with the meme, right? Um, and this stunned image seems to work. The top, the top text informs the viewer, the reader of what um, she actually denied. The bottom text seems to completely ignore her denials and persist with the same line of allegation. So what we can see is the creator of the meme highlighting the lack of truth here, the, that what Clinton claims may not actually be the way things are, and that aligns with that other, uh, with that strategy of, um, of Van Leeuwen's. <coughs> okay, and the final one is this, this strategy of um, mythopoeias. And with, um, with the Trump one here, I mean, with, I mentioned earlier this, this idea of cautionary tales. So probably most of the research that's looked at this strategy has looked at this kind of cautionary tale in terms of a, in a sort of imagined, an imagined future. The worse it is, the worse we're trying to say um, a future is under this president or this prime minister, the more they're trying to be delegitimized and vice versa, right? So what we see here with Trump is him gesturing towards a gloomy scene of a of a large wall. Looks like, I don't know, it looks like something out of some sci-fi movie or something. With uh, flying Canadian flags, tanks in the foreground. This is kind of a symbolic attribution where Trump's superimposed um, image is foregrounded prominently um, and his gesture acts as a means of guiding the viewer's gaze towards the symbolic attribute. So the gesture itself can almost be interpreted as a, interpreted as a gesture towards here's, here's the future that you'll get under me. The textual component reinforces the image and this, this overall kind of negative future projection, which aligns with this idea of myth of pieces. Same thing in the in the Clinton one. Um, looks a bit different. The second meme uses has this image of a young boy, um, quizzical, disbelieving facial expression. I don't know if any of you are familiar with this um, um, with this meme template. It's quite a popular one. Um, and it typically begins with the top text of, so you're telling me blah, blah, blah. Here it's, are you telling me? But that's typically the, the um, you know, the vibe. And then what it concludes with is more text that states a, an irrational, illogical, hard to believe kind of scenario. So here we've got this statement of Clinton being under investigation against her, um, against her status being compared with her status as a presidential uh, candidate. Templates such as this can make participation even easier when really the, the user only has to concern themselves with the punchline. The textual template is there, the image is provided. You've just got to find the right moment to use it. And that's, that's the only onus that's on the, that's on the user. Um, Now, so this claim that the 147 FBI, FBI agents investigating Clinton is almost impossible to verify. We can't verify. And this might link to Catherine's next question about an, an, anonymity. And I will touch on that in a second. So we can't verify that. Um, and it's, this is a part of, um, you know, this participatory culture where views and ideas can be shared easily and quickly, even in the absence of supporting factual evidence. But it's easy to share um, something that has no supporting factual evidence when 
we're not beholden to authorship, right? We can just do it completely anonymously um, and then run away and hide if we want one. It's out there. We put it out there. We put it into a platform or whatever. And that idea is out there. And this is one of the, I think, powerful things um, yeah, about, about internet memes. So, you know, even though they, linking back to something I said earlier, even though they can be quite simplistic, they are potentially powerful as a means of sharing ideas and perspectives with creators not needing to fear what they share as they'll never be held to account. <coughs> okay, super quickly, one or two minutes I'll wrap up. So, um, is that Pierre, was that you? Oh, that is Pierre, yeah. We can take some questions before we go into breakout rooms, Pierre. Hopefully it doesn't mean we don't have time for breakout rooms, but I, I can go slightly over anyway if, if no one else cares. Yeah. So, yeah, Vincent, sorry, did you want to say yeah. something? Yeah, I think we have a few questions in the chat. Do you want to take them now or after the break? I'll just, I'll, just do, just let, I'll just do this one slide uh, to wrap up and then we can, if that's cool. So basically my conclusions on memes so far is that the simplicity involved um, helps them facilitate a high degree of participation in a digital community. They, they help us share quickly an ideological position, whether that's sort of, um, you know, coming through heavily laden with humour or, or otherwise. <coughs> um, and importantly, Catherine, the anonymous nature of memes, I think, means that they have a kind of, a kind of hidden potential to influence the opinions and views of others. And I guess when I say hidden, the potential is not hidden, but the outcome is. We don't actually ever know how yet how people have been influenced by memes. <coughs> And one instance of this that comes to mind is this meme of Trump, Donald Trump. Whoever made this meme, I don't know if anyone ever saw this uh, when it came out. Um, whoever made this meme did so completely freely and as they wish, and they probably made it and shared it and walked away and was never asked a question about it. Um, but I, I came across this meme when my own friends started sharing it like crazy on Facebook and Instagram and so on. And it, it, it came out later that it was a hoax, right? There was, he never said this in a, in a People magazine interview. But what was really interesting to me was that, um, you know, my friend, my own friends were sharing it and I'm sure they were sharing it because... Number one, it sounded like something that he would say. Just because it sounds like something someone says doesn't mean they said it, right? Number two, it aligned with their own, and I'm, I'll happily admit mine too, it aligned with their own ideological beliefs and values. So they were less inclined to question it, right? Um, and that's, that's something that... Um, we all do all the time, I'm sure. When we see something that we agree with, we're inclined to go with that. And we then we can then and we use that as the basis for arguments. And we're probably less inclined to check the things that we agree with, whether they're true or not. But what I'd like to understand more in the future is something like this. What damage could be caused by someone who sees this and takes it as true? This is just one example. <coughs> A lot of my friends, as I said, they believed it because they thought he would say it um, and it aligned with their views. If a Republican voter in the United States saw this and believed it, would they not vote? Would they vote Democrat? It, we don't know. It's hard to say. There's no research on this. Um, so this is, this is where, what I think would be a really interesting, but hard to do, but a really interesting uh, area for, for future research. So with that, um, I do have a couple. I'm happy to share these slides later. I did just point out some other work I've done on delegitimization and memes. But um, before we get to an activity, Pierre do you, or, and or Vincent, do you want me to open up to a couple of questions? Um, I think it would be great to do that. We have a nice collection of questions. I think 
Yeah. Okay. Should I try to run through them just 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 to make it make it yeah, sure. make it easier? And I'm going to maybe crowbar a question of my own to connect it to a little bit to one that's just popped up in the chat. So I'm intrigued, and this is me being a novice in discourse analysis. Um, I'm intrigued by the difference between legitimization and delegitimization. So I wonder whether you could look a little bit about on talk a little bit about how different strategies in mean creation work. And there's a question that relates to this, whether there's any research or statistics on which mean strategy is most popular and whether there was a way to connect any understanding of the popularity or effectiveness that you just mentioned <laughs> of mean production to any intellectual value that means memes might have. So okay. essentially whether discourse analysis can, can bring us any idea of strategic e effectiveness. I think that's, that's, that's a first question to, to address. There was also a moment ago a question about um, any, any knowledge we have on who actually engages with memes, whether there's anything to do, whether, whether young people in particular are interested in this. And I want to add another another thing of my own to this, if we can hold, if, you, if this is not too much. I noticed that you strayed in your list of sources from 4chan, um, that being a slightly maybe more extreme meme factory that has produced quite a lot of things you know, that, that are normally associated with the extreme right. So I wonder whether there is a, whether we have any understanding of the different types of demographics and how they, engage with memes and meme production. So I hope that's not too many questions in one and I try to roll all the things that have popped up all right, all and right. also get my, my breakfast start, out of it. I'll, I'll start with the, the last one. And I think I, I have I have got memes um, from, I have looked at 4chan before. And on, I mean, honestly, I think I just forgot in my, in my preparation to add it to the list. And I'm sure there's one or two others, but these are the types of sites, but it's a good point because 4chan does have that, that um, you know, that connotation um, and reputation for aligning with the far right. The, um, what was the first one? Legitimization, delegitimization. I mean, I, I sort of don't see that. I mean, in a lot of political discourse, for example, when one when one political party is trying to legitimise their own policies, their own agenda, in doing so, they tend to automatically be trying to delegitimise the other as well. Does that make sense? I mean, they're kind of going on simultaneously uh, a lot of the time. Um, sometimes it's more. Sometimes it's more um, direct and overt, like you. You know, your policies are just crap. And for these reasons, right, then you're directly trying to delegitimise the opposition. But by promoting, it can be done more sort of indirectly and subtly when our policies reflect this and this and this, which differs from this party who does it this way. So it's kind of, which is a, sub, which is a more sub, subtle, subversive type of, simultaneous delegitimization if that makes sense but what i think happens in memes is you don't often see you don't often see memes that support someone they tend to be more of the delegitimizing type because it's very hard to make a joke about somewhat something you support does that make sense pierre yeah, so, so that, I think this is this is really interesting because I mean the, the one the last question in the chat was about the popularity of particular strategies, and I was struck in reading the paper that you circulated earlier that all of the forms or most of the forms of legitimization in the Van Leeuwen paper were to do with commandments for children more or less. It was to do with with schooling and assimilation into into education. They were usually quite positive examples, whereas what we're dealing with here in the case of memes, it's essentially always moral deauthorization, sorry, deauthorization and a kind of anti-rational argument. So I think there's, that that to me is, is quite interesting. And can I, can I just, just point, pinpoint, because there's two people have asked that question 
Um, do we have any understanding of user types and ages? I think that would be like who, who makes this, who reacts to memes the, the, the most? I mean, my, my research hasn't, um, hasn't gone into, into that, but, you know, there is research out there that, that points to, you know, the general demographics of who, who, who's using sites like Imgur and, and um, you know, um, Nine Gag and Facebook and Facebook and Instagram and so on, right? So, I mean, I think the the gen the broad demographics that are available give us the first sense. Um, and then there's also the um, you know the kind of the type of humor as well that you come across. I mean, I'm I'm actually I'm doing a I'm doing a paper in a couple of weeks at a conference about boomer remover memes. You might have remembered when that, that when that sort of label came out at the beginning of COVID nineteen, and you know that's a real sign of some kind of intergenerational kind of tension, right? And these were these were widely proliferated kind of memes on across all of these sites, and it's not it's not going to be um, you know it's not going to be the baby boomers who's sharing sharing these memes or you know if, if you sort of see where I'm coming from I mean I don't have the evidence in my own research um, but there is some out there but I think there needs to be more about the um, you know who's sharing them and the and also the impact of of the reception um, as well I think there needs to be a lot more of that uh, of which there's not that much at the moment, to be honest, on the reception side. I think that's a that's a fantastic point. It's kind of because we've been acculturated to this artifact and we see them all the time. It's quite easy to forget that, that you know academic research lags behind reality quite often, and and it's not necessarily in in the interest of the propagators of of these artifacts to to tell us all these things. Um, that's right. Yeah. So are there any other questions I've missed or? There was a question about an anonymity, but I think you've, you've addressed that already. Yeah. I mean, can, I, I think... can I just, can I just make, maybe just encourage you know, before we go into our breakout rooms, and of course the plan is that we will come back, but we have, we still have enough, just about enough time to use the, the breakout rooms as an opportunity to formulate any other questions. So if any, if anyone feels that, that they have things to, um, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yep, Andrew, I'm, I'm handing, okay. hand, handing it back to you, sorry. Okay, okay, so just quickly. Um, so what I was um, planning is, and I should say too, if, anyone, if anyone's interested in any um, of the papers I've done on memes or, um, and also there's this book on delegitimization in digital culture, which has a chapter of mine in it, but I edited with a colleague. Maybe, maybe I could send some of these to you, Pierre or Vincent, and if anyone's interested in them, they could contact you and you could distribute them if, if people want to read them or something. Well, so, please, please do that. That would be great. Okay, cool. So this is what I thought we would do in the, you know, we don't have as, we probably got, yeah, as Pierre said, just the right amount of, um, uh, just the right amount of time. So what I'm, going to have us do, sorry, whoops, 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 whoops. Okay, so using Van Leeuwen's framework, I'm going to distribute in a second. I don't know if it's at the beginning of the chat, Pierre, is it still when I shared it with you guys? Can everyone access that? Remember when I showed you guys at the start? I don't think so. I think we have to do it again. I'm, I'm trying to find where I saved it. So maybe you could, if you could share it again, that would be great. Yeah, okay, it's uploading now. So there's some memes in here from the 2020 election. This time, this time all around Joe Biden. Have a look at them in your breakout room. What's the joke? Is there any kind of ideological stuff uh, being done and what is it? Um, do they legitimise Biden or delegitimise him? And do they legitimise anyone else? And how do they do that? And then try to think about any of the Van Leuven strategies that I've talked about of authorization, moral evaluation, rationalization, and mythopoeias. And 
see if you think any of them align with any of those. And remember too that they're, um, as I note there, they're not they're not mutually exclusive. There can be multiple interpretations of these things as well. So is everyone able to see that in in the chat? Hopefully you are now. And if so, um, maybe I'll, I'll okay. leave it to Pierre or Vincent oh. to. Okay, let's do it. Um, so just just if you if you look at the chat right now, there's a file from Andrew which you can download. I will try maybe Andrew. I have no idea how we are going to end up distributed into this these rooms, but maybe the three of us can also share our screens to make it a little bit easier. Should we take ten minutes for for, for a bit yeah. of a chat and also maybe this also use this in an, as an opportunity to formulate any further questions. Um, and we can we can spend the last five minutes of our session together trying to to make a plan for further research. All right, um, I'm going to print. I'm going to pretend that I know how this works. I'm going to click create and see you on the other side. You should have now all been invited into your breakout rooms. So are you guys, I'll go and join one. Um, are you guys just staying uh, there? Yeah, I think, do we have to, how do we, I don't know how we join them. Yeah, how do we join? Oh, you, if you're the boss, you should be able to join anyone I'm, that you want. Yeah, I'm, and I'm you, invite. you can put Vincent okay. in. Um, oh, all right, I'm going to join three. Yeah, do you have, do you have? You can, you can send Vincent to any room that you want. I'm seeing an invitation to room three also. Okay, yeah, to go to three, Vincent, Andrew, do you have an invitation to one of them? To room one and you go somewhere else. Okay, yeah, so I'll go two. Vincent, you go to, to three, I go to two.
Um, but we might have to hang out for a little bit because they all have the other rooms. I couldn't close. I, I can't close them immediately. Fifteen more seconds. I thought we lost everyone somehow. How's Paris, Caroline? Is that Paris? It's not Paris at all. It looks like no. Up. That's actually New York, where I did my year <laughs> <Yeah>, Just, <no. laughs> just a young. little memory. <laughs> we were just young to our meeting, so yeah. Hi guys. Welcome back, everyone, or welcome back, some of you. Um, there we are. <laughs> yeah. There's not many. The half of our breakout room uh, disappeared. <laughs> well, I guess that's that's just what happens. This is where we are. Well, we have a few minutes. Those those of us who have um, stuck around get the advantage of getting Andrew to almost themselves right now. <laughs> um, maybe. I mean, if you have questions straight away, I would suggest just jump for it, unmute yourselves, chat. Yeah, yeah, um, and if not, then the alternative is to maybe try to... Um... Okay, there's a question, I think. Catherine. Yeah. Yeah, actually, I just wanted to follow up on something. If Sean is still there, uh, we were cut off just as Sean yeah. was talking about um, the, the image that used, oh, what's his name? Wilder from uh, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And she said, you know, that one caught her eye because she's seen it used in lots of different ways and lots of different means. And I wondered when an image like that is recycled, does that, um, I wonder what impact that has on the audience? Because to be honest, to me, I look at it and think, oh, it's the same old thing. Uh, and I'm more likely to dismiss it, but equally, if it's a familiar image, maybe you're more likely to pay attention to it. There's a sort of, um, one that I keep coming across is a little girl doing a knowing look um, who gets, she pops up all over the place. And what does this repetition, um, particularly if, if part of what a meme is about is it's meant to be sort of, original and getting people to think in a different way. What's going on when people keep churning out the same image of, after all, I mean, isn't that a 1970s film, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory? Yeah, well, yeah, it's a good, it's a good point. And I've, I've just put a, a paper into the, into the chat because you might find it interesting. And I'll just share my screen and show you something, um, Catherine, because it's funny, this is a paper I did in um, environmental, communication um, and in it I looked at popular meme templates and condescending wonka is one of them and that's the name of that template and it's and so it's clever because it is a familiar image but it's also the tone of the language being used so what they tend to look like is something like this Oh, you just graduated? You must know everything. <laughs> so this kind of thing, right? So in this paper, and as I said, I've just shared it, so feel free to download it and look at it. But I've used some very, very, very popular, widely used templates that adopt same phrasal template and communicate a gag in the same way but can be manipulated to address completely different issues and but the common the commonality of the I guess the the type of humor I mean I, if you want to be condescending or speak in this kind of interesting way like in the condescending Wonka meme you choose that one rather than a different template which has a slightly different um, flavor to the to the humor if if you know what I'm getting at so so anyway I'm glad you raised that because yeah, it's something that I have that I have addressed in um, in other work. So the other one, and actually, you'll see there the skeptical third world kid, which was in um, you know one of the ones I saw, the Lord of the Rings one, Velociraptor, very famous one. I love I love Velociraptor, um, but it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of like 
the repetition will will in a sense potentially give it more exposure because people might search for Wonka memes or Velociraptor memes. And they're more people might be, you know, for people out there in the digital community looking for hits and likes and that kind of thing, then choosing a popular template and then coming up, that's sort of one short step in the way there, right? And then you've just got to come up with a good gag that gets you the next bit of the way there. Um, so I think that's the the reason there. So there's a little bit more to it than just it being the 1970s film. That's the that's the familiarity for some people. But then the next step is that only a certain type of humour or a certain type of language is used in that template. Does that make sense? I don't know if that sort of answers a little bit, but you can, yeah. you know, you can look into that a little bit more, <laughs> a little bit more, Catherine. Feel free to respond if that didn't answer everything properly. Yeah, well, j- just to add, I guess um, for my group, um, what, what, what I think also came, came through was the fact that, you know, sometimes it was hard to distinguish between what was authorization or what was mitopoiesis or what was, you know, um, rationalization and um, even evaluation. So trying to identify the various delegitimized kind of discourses in, involved in these memes is also because some of them had, it, it was like a particular meme could have like Two of two of these um, discourses could have authorization, could also have evaluation, and so looking at how you know they came together in this mix match kind of way. Oh uh, yeah, and I mean that's why I sort of had that note on that slide saying, look, these are not they're not mutually exclusive categories. Um, but what I've done in my work, say in the paper I was talking about today, is I've you know I've I've, I've alerted the reader to that, that um, these are not mutually exclusive and there are multiple interpretations, like there are with most things, right? Um, but the, one, the way I presented them in the paper is the way that to the authors seem to be the strongest, right? So that, that's, that's, a, that's a perfectly legit, <laughs> dare, I, dare I use the word legitimate uh, approach, um, to justify what, how you're presenting something, if you, if you know what I mean. There's always going to be multiple interpretations of these types of things. Um, but to us, my co-author and I, these are the ones that sort of stuck out, you know, sort of stuck out the most, the most I guess. And I guess that links in too to the, the idea of the reception side um, because most work to date has been interpretive, right? It's been interpretive from the perspective of the researcher, a researcher like me, where I say, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll use this fancy framework and I'll see how I can analyse these memes in relation to this and look at it as a form of discourse. But that means nothing to the lay person out there, Right. You, you, what, what, what we do need to find out is what scholars can read and learn about as moral evaluation or authorization. If we really want to know the impact of these memes, we've got to kind of unpack these terms into sort of, you know, qualitative interview questions or surveys of users that, that are accessible to them and that aren't treating them like, sort of purely subjects of research, but, you know, and speaking to them in, in scholarly academic terms that they don't care about, but getting a sense of are you, in, are you affected by this meme because of the way it compares this bad thing to this good thing, right? That, that, kind, of, that kind of thing. And then that's how we can sort of start to get at the reception thing. I did see, I think it was from from Jay, there was a question on the reception side. So that was kind of touching on that too, Jay. That's, that's super interesting. And I think it kind of kind of connects to what, well, the, my, 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 my quandary that I re, that resonated in our, in our group, which is the, the difficulty of crediting the meme with that kind of legitimizing function where it essentially just repeats something that's already well known. 
So you had two examples on the first page of drawing up the fact that Biden was potentially a little bit gropey. That was, you know, that was the, the, the media discourse at the, at the time, which was a media discourse that everyone knew. And of course, there was a media discourse about Trump being equally incompetent in the same area. And that for me still has some kind of conceptual rift from the very, very clear cut legitimizing processes from so school, school children, again, oh, where we're telling, telling them for the first time, you don't do this, and then you, you, the because is one of those things. Then I think it's, I'm possibly also misunderstanding a little bit how legitimizing behavior and how norms are constructed within even, you know, the six-year-old population, because actually, probably when you're five or six, you have to be told things 20 different times in different ways before you acculturate to them. But I think that's the challenge of them figuring out what does an individual mean do? I mean, that's right. That's I, right. I did nothing, but suddenly, when there's a million of them around, suddenly that is the discourse which has taken over. And I think that that points to an urgency of having to go and do the next step of understanding impact, which, well, which seems yeah. to me like a fascinating, fascinating sort of subject to engage with now. Yeah, I think, I mean, it's. I do think I agree with that sort of, you know, the urgency you point to, and I think it's I think it's definitely sort of challenging. But you know, if you look at that that idea of that, I mean, that last meme of the Trump hoax one that I had on that last slide there, we can own at the moment what all we can do is, um, and all that's been really happening is this kind of interpretive sort of research right and and analysis but what we really want to know is is there a person out there who was a rub who was a republican voter who saw that meme believed it and changed right that if that if that actually happened with one person or 10 people or um or 50 people that's that's significant right like if if there mm. are people out there who don't get their news from who only get their news from social media and really follow the discourse that appears in memes. And it can go to the point where it impacts something as significant as a vote. I mean, that is something that's really, I think, important to try and to try and understand. Catherine, um, I'll, I'll just take one or two more because I've actually got to go and put the put, get the kids the kids to bed in a minute. But. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, actually, I just wonder, because one thing we discussed in our group was, um, you, so for example, there was that image of Obama and Biden and Obama with his head in his hands, which, of course, we all know that that would have been part of a longer piece of video where it was perfectly normal, he was just in thought. And yet, I wonder to what extent our sort of visual receptors are tricked by that. So I know that he was not putting his head in his hands. Nonetheless, because they chose that image, that image is now in my head of Obama doing this. And I wonder if anybody has looked at setting aside the word, just the pure visual image and what is done. So like, you know, that um, still you showed us earlier, the, the meme using Hillary Clinton with looking the kind of dumb uh, flabbergast. Yeah. Yes. And I mean, there are a million of those of Trump. Um, uh, but when you take that still out of a video, we know it's messing with our heads, but we can't stop it. Um, I wonder if anybody's done any research into that. Um, yeah, it's a good question. I, off the top of my head, I can't. Yeah, I can't put my. I'm, I'm, there, I'm sure there probably is, but I can't put my finger on it off, off the top of my head. But yeah, I mean, I think the there's always the. I mean, I guess for the perfect the perfect meme, there's this. Um, you know the. Often there's this intertextual intertextual element, right? Like the like the Willy Wonka or the, you know, the Lord of the Rings ones and that kind of thing that I showed on that other paper. But then beyond those, which which um, you know, which trigger those pop culture references and so on for most people, 
then what are you looking for if you're making a meme? You're looking for the perfect image to carry your gag, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that, I mean, that's probably, I mean, if you go onto any of these meme generating sites, I mean, it's hardly even worth looking for your own picture to make a meme anymore. There's so many, there's just so many hundreds of really awesome templates that you could, I mean, half the emails I do to my colleagues are just in memes, you know, that I use on make on meme generator.com and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, it's an interesting, it's, it's a really good point. I don't know the research. Um, I can't, yeah, as I say, I can't put my finger on who's done that work, Catherine, but I do think that um, the image, the image is, it's interesting because the image is key, but the image is nothing without yeah. the text, right? Like, it's like, it's like the one, um, which one was it I mentioned before? Just the, the official, the official um, portrait of Hillary in front of the flag, you know? Uh, yes. Without, without the text, it's not, that no one even looks at that and think that that's a joke, right? But then for it to be twisted around and make her seem to, seeming to be kind of smug, smugly smiling about what she's got away with, when that's not what would have been happening at all. She was just saying, they were just saying, smile for your portrait, right? But then for, for, the, for it to be turned around and then for the, for the viewer to be able to perceive it as being sort of a smug kind of smile is actually really interesting because that's, I'm sure there's no way that's what, what that was, right? But it looks like that because of the way the text is used. Yeah, it's really, it's really interesting. Mm, fantastic. Um, unless there are any more questions, I think it would be fair if we let Andrew go. <laughs> so I yeah, really yeah, the tip of that. Yeah, I was just going to say thanks for sticking around a little bit, a bit, a little bit later. I always love talking with new new people. But if you're interested in anything more, just send through any emails, or you know, feel free to ask for any sort of papers or anything if you find anything interesting. Thank you so much, Andrew. I'm I'm just going to completely as a non-specialist, I'm going to ram an idea that's been brewing, just as you were saying. I kind of wonder whether the alt-right has not been studied a little bit more in those kind of terms that we were just discussing. And I remember, it might have been Freeze magazine, so not academic, but kind of visual analysis ideas. Um, some quite interesting writing on, on, on your QAnon type, type kind of imagery where their memes are very different, of course. You know, they're not. I wonder whether that there isn't something kind of exciting about the marginal interest in this. And now, if you want to respond to that and tell me that I'm wrong, you can do that. But otherwise, I'm just for myself going to say thank you. Um, thank you to Andrew, to Vincent and Emily and to the PGR studio. Thank you so much for attending. Next yeah. week Thanks at the much, same bro. time, Next week at the same time, we have the last in a series of this with Jean-Lamy Rappert, who's going to be taking us through the Zoom effect where I'm sort of hoping he's going to make us all put our cameras on and just be awkward for an hour and a half. So <laughs> do join for that. It's the same Eventbrite link. If you have any, any questions you want to follow up with anyone who want to be put in touch, just reply to the Eventbrite emails that you've got and they'll come to me.